Hello and uh, welcome to the latest episode of the Good Drum Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, this afternoon, um, yeah, I know, you're going to groan, you're going to moan, it's the gin episode of the show. And <laughs> I know the gin episodes of the show get mm, virtually no views. Well, that's not strictly true. They just get less views than the whiskey episodes of the show, which, given how popular gin still is, um, is quite surprising. But... Um, Interestingly enough to say, uh, I was asked to write an article f on about gin uh, for the uh, arcade magazine, the, the arcade that uh, the, the shop uh, is in in Nottingham, and uh, I, cut, I started off by basically saying, "Gin's over. It's had its day." Um, and the the reason being uh, that I honestly believe is I think a there's too many gins now on the market. Uh, Far, far too many have been have come out in the last couple of years, um, and to outdo each other, they're coming up with more weird and wonderful and wacky botanicals. And every time you see a press release for yet another bizarrely botanical gin, like you know collagen gin or crushed bloody ants or things like that, you just sort of think. <sighs> and I honestly believe that we've we've reached peak silliness of, of, of botanicals to, to be honest with you you know um, and I can't see it going anywhere else I mean I could be wrong there could be some more odd botanicals that are going to get used I suppose but I really think that we've kind of hit the, 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 the peak of that and and the other reason I think that um, that the gin craze has, has certainly hit its peak I mean I don't think it's going to know somebody just tail off and everybody's going to go no nah, I, don't, I don't like gin anymore I think it's going to plateau I think that the, the sales will start to sort of remain relatively constant in the next couple of years um, and and then maybe just drop off a little bit I think the thing is that sort of by and large I think a lot of gin drinkers um, were initially quite adventurous I mean because of all these new gins coming out they're going yeah I've got to try this got to try that one this is the new one from so and so so and so uh, and I've read about this and I'm and I get the, the impression that a lot of these kind of people have now got a bit tired of all these new gins. They're going, well, yeah, okay, do I really, can I be bothered to taste yet another London Dry or yet another whatever? Um, and they're now starting to basically say, well, look, you know, in actual fact, I like this gin, I like X, I like Y, I like Z. Uh, and, I, uh, and that's what I'm going to stick with. And so you're getting a lot more customers, certainly in the shop, that are basically saying, um, I'll come in for a... Brockman's, for example, or a botanist's, or a Burley's, you know, uh, and uh, rather than I like gin, I fancy something different. I mean, yes, you're still going to get people coming in that are buying for presents and say, you know, that that people like certain types of gin but want something similar but a bit different, and you're still going to get people that are, are going to want to try uh, the newer ones that are coming out. But I think that pretty much by and large, I'd be amazed if we see the level of, of new gins coming onto the market next year that we have in seen in the last couple of years. I honestly think that, that it's time for something else. And, and I've heard, you know, I'm not the only person saying this. I might be the first person to say, I don't know. I mean, somebody else might have said it before me, but, um, certainly from what I'm hearing and reading about other people are starting to come to the same kind of conclusion that, that gin has, has kind of run its course and it's had a bloody good innings. I mean, you know, a lot of the, um, craze for particular spirits you know they tend to sort of last maybe about a year sometimes less um and then it's on to something else and uh, but gin has certainly been going now for sort of yeah a good good three maybe maybe yeah about three three or three three maybe four years i guess um and i don't know what's going to come next a lot of these things uh, crazes tend to be sort of um dreamt up by uh, by cocktail makers and what have you and what's the latest buzz on cocktails I have no idea, I'm not a cocktail freak, so um, whether it's going to be rum or bourbon or or something else, you know, I, I can't say it's going back to, to uh, vodka uh, again, but, uh, um, you know, anyway, so that's that's as may be but i'm doing another episode of the show on gin and and it's basically because i've got i've got a couple here that that are fairly new uh to me that have come along recently and and and, and a few that um are a little bit older that i don't think i've included in in previous episodes of the show and i just thought well why not you know let's uh, i'll share them with you guys you know because i think uh, i think 
the, the range that I've got here in front of me today is, is really quite interesting, quite impressive. All of the gins are exceptionally good, in my opinion. All of the gins are in stock, <laughs> so that, that tells you what I think of them. And they've all got their interesting quirks to them. Not because of weird and wonderful botanicals, although some do have some, some unusual ones that I, I must admit that I don't know about. But um, uh, because at the end of the day, the product is bloody good and that's that's you know and that's what interests me and some of them have other uh, angles and connotations which also interest me as well which I will obviously point out when uh, when I introduce the lineup so anyway I think you've probably heard enough about me waffling about what I think about gin and uh, the marketplace and all that kind of stuff I think it's um, just time to introduce the lineup just go to right okay so like in previous episodes of the show when I've tended to do gin, I've just basically decided that the easiest way to do it is of course go from lowest ABV up to the highest ABV. So that's exactly what I'm going to do today. Although I'm going to kick off with the, the, the most recent uh, arrival in the shop and the most recent uh, gin that I've tasted. And this is called the Pin Gin, produced by the Bottomley Distillers in Lincoln. Now, um... I like having local products in the shop, and obviously, there's not, there isn't a local whiskey distillery, so that's that's out of the question. Um, and um, so it's 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 other spirits, and and there's a couple of gin distilleries, and uh, this is the most recent one. And you're probably going to say, well, why aren't you doing the Nottingham gin? And well, I would have done it. Well assuming it tasted okay, uh, but the guy that, that, that makes it gave us all the flam and waffle about, yeah, yeah, I really want Gauntlets to stock my gin, and it never bothered to get back to us at all. So basically, if he can't be asked, I can't be asked either. And um, anyway, so that's that's a negative thing. The, the positive thing about this is that this is a relatively new gin. I think they, they started distilling last year or something like that. Um, or might have even been this year in actual fact. So uh, based in, in, in Lincolnshire, this contains 10 fairly, well, I mean, um, and this, this is another weird, another thing, you know, that they've told me um, some of them and yet not all of them. Were, and, 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 and this is another thing I can't figure out about, about certain gins, is, you know, why hide what your botanicals are? You know, does it matter? Uh, I mean, yeah, all right, so a competitor, in inverted commas, could use exactly the same botanicals, but you know, it's all about the ratio of the botanicals and does it work with the spirit and yada yada yada. Um, but anyway, so obviously, this contains juniper, uh, they also use rose, black pepper, uh, ground almonds, which I think is quite interesting because that's kind of like a, a bit of a hint, uh, nod towards uh, genevas. There's a couple of genevas I've tasted that use ground almonds, and probably more importantly, is the, la the, the, the next two botanicals, um, that being lavender and cucumber. and I've, I don't particularly like la cucumber as, as a, a botanical. It, whenever I've tasted a gin that's featured botanical, that botanical, it's always tasted a bit green and watery. And, and lavender just tends to be too oily and just blankets everything. So um, I must admit, when I first sort of like saw the, the, the botanical list, I was a little bit sort of wary. But you know, I, shall, I shall tell you what I thought when I come around to tasting it. Um, the second one we're going to be looking at is called Le Gin, which kind of gives a game away from where, it's, where it comes from. It's a French gin uh, produced by the distillery De Terre Rouge. And um, the, the botanicals, again, um, are fairly standard, I would say. They're coriander, juniper, orange peel, oris, cinnamon, angelica, cardamom, and three mystery ones. Um, and so there's nothing weird and wacky about that. But the interesting thing I think about this is called is because is the clue is in the title. Not only is it called Le Gin, it's called Le Gin One and Nine. Now the reason being for that is that um, they take the base spirit and in the second distillation they just purely distill it with the juniper and then macerate the further nine botanicals in the finished spirit for however long they do it for I honestly don't know but um, so it's kind of like a, a kind of a hybrid distilled bathtub kind of gin and, and there's not a lot of bathtub gins around and the ones I have tasted tend to be very very intense and very pungent 
uh, with the, regards to the botanicals. So that, I think that's going to be quite an interesting one to sort of see, you know, um, how the, the, the hybrid um, uh, method kind of works. So, and moving on, we're moving on to the third, and this is f uh, from obviously uh, the um, from Burley's uh, the, the 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 story out at. Uh, um, at Loughborough and um, big fan of Burleys, it has to be said. So, uh, and I'm pretty certain that uh, they're going to be watching the show. So, um, can't say anything bad about them, can I? Um, anyway, so this is the pink gin. This was originally a limited edition gin uh, that Jamie produced, uh, and I now think it's part of the core range, so to speak. Um, and it's, I, I'm, I'm, it's got a, a Japanese twist to it, uh, which is quite interesting because the last gin in the tasting is from Japan, but anyway, I, that's getting ahead of myself. So basically it uh, features uh, Japanese cherry blossom, hibiscus, rose and pink grapefruit. So obviously as you can see, it doesn't make the gin pink, the bottle is pink, um, and yes it's kind of, we know it's aimed at the girlies, um, but you know, let's, let's see what the gin itself is like, uh, certainly um, you know, Jamie is no slouch when it comes to, to uh, distilling and producing gin. I mean, he probably has forgotten more things about gin than I actually know about them, I imagine. But anyway, so that's number three. Number four uh, is the Eden Mill Original, a uh, bottle of 42%, uh, obviously from Scotland. Um, and again, the, the interesting thing about this particular gin is it's sort of like uh, some of the Scandinavian gins and... Um, the Australian gins and things like that in that they've obviously taken some of the botanicals from the locale and they're trying to sort of give it a kind of not necessarily a tawar feel I mean that was the latest thing I was reading about. bloody tawar in gin I mean oh, come on you know we are really getting too anal about this whole thing now I think um, but anyway no I like the idea of a, of a gin reflecting the environment it comes from and certainly I think the Eden Mill does that the other interesting thing about it is a vapor infused gin so the idea is that you know having the the botanicals in a in a basket within the neck of the still you should get a lighter more elegant delicate style of gin which we will have a look at and uh, they use uh, juniper, uh, angelica, citrus peel, sea buckthorn, which is obviously keen to the uh, the area, uh, or sea buckthorn berries, I should say, uh, coriander seed and lemon balm. So, uh, although, like I said, many, I think I've reviewed their, their gin before, that when I originally uh, asked for samples from them, uh, especially because I knew they were, they, they were doing whiskey, I was told, uh, no. Um, so it's kind of like, it, well, this comes from the distributor anyway. So anyway, it's, it's kind of like, yes, I am tasting your stuff, whether you like it or not. And I am stocking it, whether you like it or not. Um, talking of, uh, of, of feedback, I was amazed at the absolute lack of retweets or interest from... Uh, the, the companies that um, supplied the samples for last week's episode, nothing from Compass Box. I mean, I, you know, normally they're right in there on the whole social media thing. Bugger all. I mean, even Morrison and Mackay, for Christ's sake, and I deal with Morrison and Mackay directly and buy from them and bloody well emailed them and said, look, I've used your old Perth in this week's episode of the show. Did I get a reply? Did I get bugger all? Anyway. I'm not doing it for their their sake, shall we say? This is obviously I'm doing it for for mine and uh, to entertain you guys. But yeah, you've got to have a moan sometimes, haven't you? Anyway, coming back to the gins. Um, so the 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 the, uh, the fourth gin we'll be looking at. The fifth gin, sorry, we'll be looking at is um, the Arbiki Highland Estate Kirsty's Gin. Now I can't remember if I've included this in in an episode of the show or not. I have a feeling I might have done, but you know, again, this is another. Uh, gin that is obviously tied to its environment not only do they grow the potatoes to make the, the vodka which is the base spirit for the for the gin uh, again they use you know locally sourced botanicals including kelp carline thistle um, blueberry and juniper so again this is another sort of locale based kind of um, gin and that's the kind of thing that sort of floats my boat so to speak and um, 
finally we'll be looking at this which is the the, the uh, Japanese gin called Ki no Bi uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly uh, from the Kyoto distillery in uh, Japan and uh, I believe this was the, the whole thing was set up by um, Marcin Miller of a number one drinks company who kindly sent me the sample and uh, um, I believe they, uh, well, I don't know whether poached is the right word, but they certainly got um, Alex Davis on board, who used to be at um, Cotswolds Distillery, uh, and I've met on a couple of occasions, and is a really nice guy, and obviously a talented uh, gin maker, and again, the botanicals have an obvious Japanese twist to them, uh, they include not only the base spirit, which is made from, from rice, uh, they then use uh, juniper, orris, ginger, bamboo leaves, red perella, lemon and yazua peel. Now, I have no clue what yazua is, but I think it's some form of citrusy type of thing. Um, uh, they also use uh, sancho pepper, kinomi leaves, I'm probably not going to pronounce this next one right at all, so you'll have to excuse me if I murder this. Gyokern green tea and hinoki wood. So, you know, can you actually cram any more Japanese botanicals into a gin? I think not. Um, so, really interesting. But that doesn't stop there. Um, whether this was, uh, the, the, you know, what they planned to do on, all along or whether this was a, a part of the process which they kind of um, developed as, uh, as they went along. They separate all the botanicals into six categories, that being base, citrus, tea, spice, fruit, floral and herbal, and then they're all distilled separately. It's almost, it's very similar to um, uh, Schmogen. Uh, where Pa basically does, I think, three, if memory serves me correct, and then blends them all together. But Alex obviously decided he's going to do six, which makes sense. You kind of break them all down, and then you've got, you know, the uh, ability to balance up your spirit when you're blending it together. Again, I'm guessing this is partly due to um, a, a sort of a whiskey-ish kind of background. Um, and... Um, then when they do the distillation, they then blend it back in with the previous distillation, and the whole thing is to make it consistent. So, uh, um, like I said, I think that we've got six really interesting gins for one reason or another, so um, I think it's now time to taste some. Oh, so, let's kick off with the pin gin. Let's, let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Fresh. There's a lovely spirit character. Now, this is one of the things that I often say about gins: that is that I like to. I don't just want neutral spirit and and it all to be about the botanicals. I like to have at least an inkling that there is some spirit character underneath that, and it's got a an almost kind of wheaty spirit kind of character. Now, I don't know whether the base spirit is produced from wheat. Uh, I mean, sort of out Lincolnshire way. I mean, could could be anything I mean you know certainly if you think about um, the uh, tea gins which uh, are distilled in Cambridgeshire they use uh, sugar beet which uh, is quite uh, quite common to be grown out uh, it that part that way so um, it's got a, a bit of nuttiness I'm certainly getting the, the, the ground almonds I'm not getting a huge amount of the cucumber thankfully um, there's a little bit of um, of lavender just kind of sitting in the background it's sort of coming across almost like sort of, dare I say it, cold tea leaves. Um, but that's kind of, I'm guessing, sort of like the spice as well. A little bit of pepper. I mean, I like this. I like, I, like I said, I like the natural raw kind of feel to it. It's not polished. Um, and it's certainly got some um, spirit character. And like I said, it kind of reminds me a little bit of... Um, of the, the the tea gins in that kind of it has that same kind of natural kind of uh, quality. So let's see what the parts like. It 
again, quite heavy, oily, wheaty, lots of spirit impurities which float my boat. Um, juniper is quite subtle and certainly um, comes through sort of quite quite pleasantly on the mid palate. And the interesting thing is again the cucumber and the um, lavender only really kind of come through right on the finish and again very subtle. I mean yeah there's a little bit of oiliness to, to the lavender but because it doesn't seem to be too dominating too much of it it's not kind of blanketing all the other uh, botanicals in its kind of oiliness shall we say so really nicely bounced loads of spirit character um yeah that's that's a nice tune so let's move on to le gin one and nine let's see what those give us on this end shall we Lots of smoky juniper. I love I love the smoky juniper character. Some um, and uh, there's a bit of licorice, aniseedy sort of notes. Touch cardamom. Certainly getting a, a little bit of black pepper. It's got a lovely warmth to it. Um, and although I'm not getting a huge amount of, of spirit character, the, the the sort of the botanicals are giving it a kind of a rounded warmth. Um, and it's really nicely balanced. The the juniper just sort you can is is not too too intense. Um, maybe some of the other botanicals like the um, the cinnamon and um, the spices and the what feels like aniseed tend to be sort of slightly in front of the the juniper. But I really like this. So I think this is not only an interesting gin because of its manufacture. Um, it, I think this is actually a really, really nice gin. Nice and full and weighty. Let's see what the palette's like. Again, full, weighty. Lovely spicy middle, black pepper, a touch of orris possibly, um, maybe some, some coriander, um, lovely sweet um, cinnamon on the finish. Um, again, the juniper is quite subtle, uh, it's rounded, it's full. I mean, I don't, I can't quite pick up on what the, the base spirit might be. It certainly doesn't seem to sort of say wine to me. Um, which would be an obvious uh, base spirit to use uh, in France. Um, it's possibly wheat, um, but but even so, I still think that's a really, really nice gin. It's very full, it's rounded, um, loads and loads of character, and got a nice spiciness to it as well, which, uh, which I kind of like, as you know. <laughs> Probably when thinking about it, I should have done this one, the, the Burleys, slightly before that, given the fact that this is sort of slightly more aromatic, shall we say. Uh, well, I'm kind of, sorry, jumping the gun there a little bit. But anyway, let's uh, see where the nose goes. Aromatic, funnily. Um, you can get the, the, the little bit of pink grapefruit. It's got some lovely juniper. There is a floral kind of note to it, which I'm guessing is hibiscus, but uh, I can't remember the last time I actually smelt hibiscus. So, um, but again, it's got a nice warmth to it. There's a, a light citric edge. Um, it's harmonious, and I think that's one of the things that I love about the, the, the Burley's gin is it is a very harmonious gin. Um, you don't tend to sort of find spikes of, of certain sort of botanicals is all very together shall we say um, and yeah this is slightly more floral than than say something like the uh, like, like the signature for example uh, which is what you would expect given the um, uh, you know the, the hibiscus and the um, uh, the, uh, the the Japanese cherry blossom and um, I think it's a lovely gin it's an elegant balanced you know Pleasant, really nice gin. Let's see what the palette's like. Like. 
quite oily. Um, subtle, again, it's got a little bit of spice coming through in the middle, touch of juniper, a little bit of, of floral notes. And that, that pink grapefruit is, is definitely there. It's giving it a, and it sounds like a stupid thing to say, but a kind of a pink feel. Um, although it's not sort of uh, in your face again, it's all very relaxed, restrained, and um, yeah, to a certain extent, I think, um, from what I know of Jamie Baxter, it's like kind of, I can see the, the correlation between his characteristics and uh, and the gin, although he'll probably disagree with me and say he's more wild than uh, than this. But um, even so, I think this is a, a, a beautiful gin. Aromatic, uh, delicate, elegant, and um, yeah, I think uh, I think this is just really very, very good. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to uh, the Eden Mill. Let's uh, see what notes gives us on this end, shall we? Fresher, crisper, almost a saltiness to it, but not quite. Just a, just a, yeah, just a, a little possibly. I'm getting some, what I, can, I assume is the, the thistle notes. It's got that kind of, Sounds a bit stupid to say, but kind of prickly floral kind of character, if you see what I mean. It's not, not sort of effusively floral. It's got that kind of sort of edgy sort of floral, I guess. As a touch of spice again, certainly getting a little bit of coriander. The juniper is quite subtle. But again, it's, it's quite harmonious. It's all nicely balanced. It's got a little bit more of a, a fresher edge to it than... Um, say the uh, the Lurgin or the the, the the Burley's Pink, but it's again it's absolutely lovely. I mean, there is a a, a sort of a, a sort of coastally edge, which I'm guessing is probably coming from the sea buckthorn and, and the fact that it's you know exposed to the um, uh, the, the sea salty air. But again, it's just a you know, a, a lovely harmonious gin. Let's see what the pulse like. A little bit more spirit character, a little bit more milkiness. Possibly barley based, maybe. Um, although quite drying spiced finish as well it's kind of the spice mingling in with the salt and um, again I think it's really nicely balanced I, I love the spiciness to it um, but again it's offset by the sort of like the salt and the not quite citric character um, but yeah again it's really well balanced and, and, and again I come back to maybe the, the episode of the show where I um, showed the gin that I produced at um, at Burley's where again I was going for a heavy spice mixture but needed to balance it up with something and I didn't really want to go down the citrus route I didn't want the, the sharpness I wanted sort of that, a softer sweetness which is why I opted for the um, uh, the hops in the, in the end and I thought that worked really well and this is it with when it comes to gin it's all about balancing up the botanicals getting you know the balance between the sort of like the spice and the floral and the juniper and all that kind of stuff uh, and I think this works really really nicely I love the spiciness of it um, and, and, and the sort of citric-ish sort of salty twist to, to to the gin I think that's that's a really nice gin so um, yep you might not have actually sent me any samples but I still like your gin even there <laughs> So let's move on to the uh, Arbiki. This is, uh, like I say, I mean, similar kind of thing to the uh, the Eden Mill, but let's uh, see if it uh, if it differs or not. Oh yeah, um, that's that's really fresh. It's an almost almost kind of pepperminty kind of freshness. Um, touch of berries. Certainly can smell the seaweed and with that kind of um, kind of almost kind of greeny sort of seaweed, you know, not like that, not the sort of like the, the blacky sort of seaweed. Um, 
Or maybe there is a sort of an element to it of that. Um, certainly it's intense, it's got a real pungency to it and, and the juniper is slightly smoky. Um, there's a, a real starchiness to it as well. Again, it's one of these gins like um, the Pinjin that, that doesn't hide what its base spirit is produced from. Um, and you can certainly sort of smell the starchy sort of potato character. So, um, yeah, I like that. That's, that's impressive. And it's certainly a popular gin in, in the shop, it has to be said. Let's see what the, the palette gives us. Soft, starchy, rounded, subtle juniper, touch of berries, again a little bit of saltiness, just balancing up that kind of starchy spirit character. Um, mm, I like that, again subtly spiced, not too heavy, um, loads of spirit character, yeah that, that kind of ticks my boxes as, as far as gins go, certainly um, tasting them neat anyway. As a, a little sweetness as well, almost kind of florally kind of sweetness, uh, sort of certainly on the finish, which kind of offsets the slight saltiness as well. And uh, it it really does make your tongue kind of mm, mm, yeah tingle and sort of you know mm, yeah. So it's kind of hitting all the right spots as far as I can see. That's a, a really very very good gin. Finally, let's move on to the Kino B. Uh, let's uh, see what notes we've on this end, shall we? Now you really pick up the green tea and the woody notes to start off with. Um, again, it's got quite a quite a heavy but fresh spirit character. Um, there's a a touch of spice, a little bit of. Juniper, there's a little, little sort of leafy note sort of happening there as well, but it's again elegant, a little bit perfumed, but but not too much. There's a sort of almost sort of slightly sub camphory kind of medicinal note. Um, that is really really complex. I mean, you just keep sticking your nose in and, and a new aroma kind of sort of pops up it has to be said but um, the tea is quite sort of forward um, but that is really impressive really really complex um, just just a lovely gin it has to be said and again you know the, the juniper is there but it's not the sort of you know it's not in your face juniper um, I mean, there are other gins, obviously, that, that have that. I mean, if you want big, big juniper, you go for things like maybe Death's Door, for example. Um, and uh, But this has just got so much complexity uh, and is, is just really, really impressive. Let's see what the power gives us. Her palate is kind of quite different to the nose actually. Um, kind of kicks off with more of the lemon balm, um, which seems to sort of take centre stage. Um, I'm certainly getting a little floral note coming through, a touch of spice on the middle, a little bit of juniper, um, some pepper. Not getting so much of the tea actually. The tea and the woody notes kind of seem to have been relegated quite to, to, to the finish and only come through towards the, the, the end um, but it's got a lovely progression um, and although like I said the lemon balm does seem to be sort of like quite forward um, it kind of sort of underpins everything else if you see what I mean um, there's a bit of weight from the spirit as well and um, 
A hmm. little bit of woodiness on the finish. I really like this. I mean, like I said, really complex, great progression. Um, just an uh, just an all round fabulous fabulous gin. I think. Yeah, really great finish. <laughs> Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Um, like I said, so I think the, the, the whole gin craze is, is, is starting to run its course. I think we're going to basically start to see a few of the more weird and wonderful, wacky kind of gins disappearing over the next year or so. And, and um, it's probably not such a, a, a bad thing, but um, yeah, like I said, there's still some wonderful gins out there. Um, the pin gin... Um, yeah, that's a lovely gin. Like I say, local, um, uh, lots of spirit character, just, just the way I like my gin, so really nice. Um, the Le Gin, I, I, I mean, again, it's a lovely rounded, soft, um, so, you know, spiced gin, um, possibly kind of, I think it's not sort of about the, the production method, which is the most intriguing, although it is an intriguing aspect of it if the gin was crap then you know i wouldn't want to stock it no matter you know how intriguing the production method um so really nice um the burleys well you know um let's put it this way jamie is not going to produce a crap gin full stop you know and and that is not a crap gin <laughs> um the eden mill yeah i like the eden mill gin again it kind of like has that sort of feeling of, of, of where it's from um it's a you know got some lovely complexity um and um yeah i think i think yeah part of the attraction of this particular gin is the packaging and i've, I've not kind of touched on the whole packaging angle but um let's put it this way you know it's <laughs> It seems to be an important part of of um, people choosing their gins. Yeah, it's you know whiskey whiskey drinkers are quite happy with a tall round, and they don't really care what it's what it's in. To be bluntly honest with you, they're more interested in the spirit. A lot of gin purchases are made with with the eye, um, and hence you have the funky bottle shapes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know. Packaging does not make the product at the end of the day, but it's quite nice when it does uh, add to the whole overall feel and certainly the um, ceramic bottle of the um, Eden Mills uh, kind of works. Uh, the Arbiki, yeah, again, love the whole kind of concept. I love the sort of like the, the, the you know, I wouldn't say Tuar base because it's not, you know, it's got bollocks all to do with Tuar in my bloody opinion um, it's more about the basically I can taste the base spirit and the the botanicals kind of give me a feel for the for the area and from where it's come from so if you want to call that Tuar fine um, just you know but it's a good gin at the end of the day and the Kino B um, just really really complex and you know you can taste a gin that has you know a, a list of botanicals as long as your arm and sometimes it's just too much you just can't taste all of the the facets of of too many botanicals and it just becomes a bloody mess um with with the kino b you certainly can i mean yeah all right the the, the nose has got that lovely woodiness uh, whereas the palette is more lemon balm centric but even so it is just really complex and it just works really well again the packaging is really nice um, and I just think it's a, a really very very good gin as they all are so so there you have it that's this week's episode of the show I hope I've not kind of bored you too much by ranting about various things but uh, um Anyway, we'll probably be back to whiskey next next week. Um, I'll figure that out <laughs> at some stage um, uh, as to what we're gonna gonna be doing. But as for today, I, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show, and I really don't care if you retweet it or not. Good afternoon. <laughs>